Should I put up my full screen? That would be great. Okay. Thank you. Holly Walker is our speaker today. Welcome to Let's Talk Gardens, Smithsonian Gardens weekly webinar series that helps you turn your brown thumb green or sometimes helps you with other different things and excites you about the world that surrounds your gardens as well as inside of your gardens. Today's presenter is going to be very noisy. Well, her guests are very noisy actually, and I'm sure you've seen them out in the gardens lately. They're here, they're everywhere, and we're excited to tell you more about them. In the meantime, my name is Cindy Brown. I am the Manager of Education and Collections at Smithsonian Gardens. And we ask you to put your questions in the chat box during the presentation, and then we'll answer them when Dr. Holly Walker finishes her presentation. Holly is an entomologist galore, and she has taught me so much about insects and made me a bit more patient about those insects that visit me that maybe I'm not as interested in having them in my garden. So I'm excited to hear what she has to say about cicadas and what she can tell us to be more tolerant or maybe more ravenous and we might take care of our problem that way. But Holly, I'm gonna go ahead and disappear, but please let us know all about these interesting insects that are surrounding us this year. I'm excited to hear more. Thank you, take it away. I'll disappear, but I'll come back at the end and ask questions. Sounds good. I hope everybody can hear me all right. Um, thank you so much for having me here today. And thank you, Cindy, for that introduction. I really appreciate for everyone who's shown up. Um, I'm really looking forward to this because uh, I also have some special guests with me today. They'll be joining us for this talk. Um, but I really love cicadas. I just think that they're really fascinating insects. They're very docile. You might notice a few will be crawling on me through this conversation, um, but they're just really unique. And what's even better is that we have this opportunity to kind of see such a fascinating phenomenon and it's occurring all around us. And most of the time, I don't think we realize, you know, what goes into such a cool, large, um, event like this. So I hope that today through this conversation, I can teach you guys a little bit about cicadas, um, answer some questions that you guys have, and just give you a little bit of extra appreciation for them. So the cicadas are coming and we are in brood X or brood 10. Uh -oh. There we go. So uh, for those of you who aren't familiar, uh, if you're not, especially if you're not in this area particularly, um, the brood X or brood 10, so actually the brood number is a Roman numeral. So, you know, again, most people have been referring to them as brood X, but they are um, number based. And so these are emergences of cicada species, and you'll find out that it's not just one cicada species that's coming out right now, but it's a group of cicada species that are synchronized with each other. And this particular designated group is a 17 year cicada um, emergence, so a 17 year cicada brood that is synced with each other. And um, what's really kind of neat is, you know, just how perfectly timed these individuals are. And the other part of this is just the fact that um, we really get to kind of bear witness to this coming of age event. So you'll find out as we talk more that, you know, they've been preparing for this for the last 17 years. Depending on your age, you've probably at least witnessed one other um, previous brood coming out, hopefully if you were in the right kind of area for them. But it's just really, to me, kind of a great celebration of a, hey, you're an adult, you've come into the world. And, you know, experiencing this is just really kind of an exciting thing to, you know, witness. So before I get way too into, you know, the periodical cicadas and some of the other stuff about them, I always think it's important to step back and look at what they are and just learn some basic facts about cicadas. And one of the biggest things is that cicadas are insects. And what does that mean for them in terms of life cycle and certain features about them? So we're gonna just step for a little bit into talking about cicadas in general. So one of my favorite lines that I always, you know, hear people say is, you know, a lot of people use the term bug indiscriminately whenever they're referring to insects, but bugs are very specific insects. So this phrase, a bug is always an insect, but an insect is not always a bug, is meant to kind of relay that idea that um, you know, just because 
you say that if I say the word bug, I am talking about a very specific group of insects. And so this is just a very basic um, phylogenetic tree. And um, it doesn't even cover all the different types of insects orders we have, but it's just kind of give you an idea when you think about cicadas and when you think about the term bug, you know, what you're actually talking about if you are trying to use it more specifically or the correct way that an entomologist would use it. And so when I say bug or true bugs, that means I'm actually talking about the order Hemiptera. So much as like if I was to say, you know, dragonflies or damselflies or beetles, beetles in particular. That means I'm talking about um, coleoptera. So when I say bug, a cicada is a bug. It is a true bug and it fits into this particular order. And there's actually a really cool history if you ever want to do a little bit more of a deep dive in this, and we'll talk a little bit about it, which is the fact that they were part of another group that kind of got sunk into Hemiptera and now has had a major name change. So let me just talk a little bit very briefly about these true bugs and how cicadas fit into this. Now there's features that make insects um, true bugs or hemipterans, but it's funny because cicadas don't actually have all of the features that we usually associate with hemipterans like a half wing, um, things like that. But a lot of times with um, true bugs, you'll often see that they have like a scleritized plate. So a hard plate that's in between their wings. Um, one of the other things is this idea of not having a complete metamorphosis. And so go back to when you think about like a butterfly and you have this complete metamorphosis because you have these larval or nymphal stages. So in that case, it's a larval stage, but in the um, cicada, it would be a nymphal stage. And so with that, they're just getting to a phase where they just get to be bigger and bigger until they come out as adults. Whereas in a complete metamorphosis, you know, go back to what you were thinking about with that butterfly, which is that you have these larval stages, they're feeding, then they go into a chrysalis or pupae like stage, and then the adult looks completely different. So, you know, that's something that kind of uh, signifies them as being different than maybe some of the other orders. And I like in this particular um, image is, so this is actually a breakdown of some of the different groups inside like the true bugs. And what you probably notice here is that cicadas are in this middle group. And I will give you guys lots of fun insect trivia words if you ever want to play trivia. Um, so that group is called Okinoranka. Um, I'm probably even not saying as well as I possibly could. But it's interesting because cicadas are actually very closely related to plant hoppers, leaf hoppers, and tree hoppers. And for those of you who are in Pennsylvania and Delaware right now, they are somewhat in that same group with things like the spotted lanternfly. So you might be experiencing a different form of massive outbreak of a similar type of species, uh, one that's been invaded, that has invaded in the United States and is you know, causing a lot of issues for trees, whereas our cicadas, as you're gonna find out, are actually very good for our trees and good for plant health around here. One of the things I think is really neat about cicadas in particular is that, you know, in terms of being an order and how long we've known about cicadas, they're actually a very old lineage. And when I was doing a lot of research about cicadas, you know, they talk about the fact that the first kind of primordial cicada morphs that we find in fossils actually can go back to about 270 million years ago. Now, that being said, a lot of other insects actually started to evolve at this time as well. But when we think of the grand scheme of when things started to arrive, you know, dragonflies, they actually have a much more primitive ancestor that's even further back than that. But I still think of cicadas as being this very old lineage and that they've been around for millions of years. Um, and what I think is really kind of neat about that is, you know, they've changed obviously through time, but not a ton. And um, it's neat that like when you look back at history and references to cicadas through time. So I actually gave a talk with um, our archives group, our art archives group. And this was one of the questions they said is, you know, are there um, references to uh, cicadas in history? And it was neat to find things like Homer's Iliad references cicadas and that there are these beautiful jade carvings of cicadas from like the early Shang dynasty and like all throughout history, cicadas have actually shown up in art and in um, poems and in stories. So they really are a part of us and they're a part of our culture because we've observed these really neat events. That being said, the 17 year cicadas are not a common occurrence. Most of our cicadas come out much more frequently and we're gonna talk about the difference between periodical cicadas and our annual cicadas. But it's just this really kind of fascinating idea that we've been observing them doing these life cycles for such a long time. So with that, 
So I did want to jump back for one more second because this is going to lead into another question that a lot of people have about cicadas. But a lot of people don't understand the different types of mouth parts that insects have. And usually I try and break it out to two different types in a very simple way. I like to simplify it as you either have chewing mouth parts, so like insects that have mandibles. Um, we have a lot of beetles that have like the chewing mouth parts or think of a caterpillar that's like chewing on the leaf sort of situation. And then you also have a lot of insects. Maybe some of you have dealt with aphids and you know even some of the other uh, sucking insects. Mosquitoes, though we won't want to get into that today. But cicadas are in the uh, are the type of insect or have the type of mouth parts where they have what's called a beak or a straw, which is actually a type of stylet. That's the official term for it. But it's really kind of neat. So I actually wanted to show you a diagram. I know old school diagrams, but I I really can never get away from these because they really let you see the insect in a different sort of way, which is neat that you can kind of see these tubes that come together that kind of create a straw like structure and has a pointed end so that it's able to, you know, be able to inject into um, a root or stem depending on the life stage. And then actually what's neat is it might be hard to see but this there's a large um, kind of like shield on the front of the face. And actually when you look at them from the side, you'll notice it's a structure that kind of falls out or pulls out a little bit. And this part of the face is actually houses a massive sucking pump, which allows them to pull sap and the phloem from the, or the xylem, sorry, the xylem from whatever they're feeding on. So it's really good to kind of notice like why these guys are different maybe from other insects, but just in the way that they feed. So for those of you who have never really looked at a cicada up close, or maybe just a little too creeped out to get that close to them, especially since when sometimes you get a little close, they tend to freak out, they tend to flap around, they tend to fly off. So this is just a really easy way to kind of look at one up close and personal. And um, let's see if I have ability. It's hard, I don't have a pointer on here, but what I will show you is, so remember what I was talking about. So look at the head of the cicada and you see, first of all, the little antennae coming up so they have very fine antennae. And then the other neat thing is look over to the eye. People always mention that they feel like the insect that cicadas have a pupil. This is actually a really neat feature called a pseudo pupil, pupil sorry. And um, what it is is they don't actually have a pupil, but remember that insects have compound eyes and it's made up of all these different um, uh, photoreceptor cells. And what it is is that pupil that you think that you're seeing is actually when you're staring onto those receptor cells straight on. So actually it will move depending on where you are looking at the insect. And so the other uh, photoreceptor cells, they're reflecting out the light, but those dark spots that you see or what identifies a pupil is actually you looking uh, directly onto it where the light is not being reflected. So I just always think that that's such a cool factor is we see a pupil, but really what it is is that's us looking dead on into the eye. Um, if you go just to the left of the eye, again, here's that protrusion that's coming out in front of the face. And so this, the rostrum, is actually where they're housing that um, pumping mechanism. And then as you follow it down, it's really kind of hard to see because the mouth actually starts to fold back between the legs, but that little straw-like structure that's coming through, that is the actual mouth part. And a lot of times they will kind of press it up against their bodies a little bit, you know, obviously don't want to get it, you know, caught on things or, you know, damage it. But you know it's actually pretty sturdy, and they'll use that to probe around, um, especially on twigs and branches. And if they're nymphs, they're going to be doing this underground, and they're going to be doing this on roots. But yeah, I just think that it's a really good idea to kind of look at the cicada up close and kind of look at these different features, so you start to understand why they do things or why they can't do certain things, um, such as you know how they could or couldn't hurt us. Uh, so this was a little bit back to what I was talking about before. So cicadas, what they do is when they've hatched out, they drop down to the ground. So they're laid up, the eggs are laid up in a branch or in a tree. And then once they hatch, the nymphs will actually fall down from the tree or the branch. And they, when they land on the ground, they want to go down and they want to start getting to the roots of various types of plants. Ideally, cicadas are going to want to eventually get to tree roots, but there is some um, information out there that says that they will these first these newly hatched cicadas will actually start to feed on grass roots initially and then once they get to a certain point they'll then start to burrow down further and they'll start to look for um tree roots which is interesting because some of the studies on cicadas have said that you know even though they're very closely associated with trees 
um, they tend to prefer edge environments. So they tend to prefer these areas where you have grasses next to trees. And that again, kind of facilitates this idea that they like to feed on these grass roots initially when they're very small and then eventually move on to these um, tree roots. Uh, oops, sorry. So the other thing is, as I was talking about before, is that the adults do some feeding. Now they don't do a lot of feeding. And some of that is that the adults will feed on um, twigs and branches. And I know a lot of people have concerns and we'll talk a little bit about the types of damage that cicadas can do. But the reality of the matter is, is that their feeding damage isn't actually really causing any harm to the trees. And so when I was talking about their ability to like feed on the root system, you wonder like, what are they getting out of those roots? Well, they're actually tapping into the xylem which is the plant's ability, you know, it's the, the um, tubes that allow the plant to pull up minerals and water. And so they're actually feeding on these roots as the plant is sucking up these water and minerals through their system. And so they're able to tap into that and feed off of these plant juices, um, which is really kind of nice because even though you would think that with all these cicadas down there uh, feeding off of the roots that this would somehow harm the tree, but they're really not taking that much that it actually has any real damaging effect on any of the trees, especially in mature trees. Mature trees can handle very high numbers of cicadas and have no signs of damage from them. So again, they're not going to do any significant feeding damage to plants, um, particularly to trees, because you know the trees are really kind of are much more robust. And then when you think about the scale of the cicadas, versus the scale of the tree, it's very unlikely that that cicada is going to do enough damage or take enough from the tree that it's going to impact its growth. So, all right. So this leads me into that other part of the question. And what I was trying to lead up to with the mouth parts is the idea of people always ask me if, um, if they can get hurt by cicadas. Um, obviously, I have a bunch on me. I'm not worried in any sense that they would ever do anything to hurt me. Some people don't like the way that they feel when they're walking up your arm. But um, the biggest thing you should be aware of with them is that they do have that little probing mouth part. Some people do not like the way that that feels. So if you are holding one for any extended period of time in your hand, you may notice that you start to feel like more pressure and more poking. If you start to feel this, just move the cicada or place it somewhere else so that it doesn't try and use you for food. Um, again, they don't really, they really can't sting you. They don't have stinging. I have an individual next to me who is singing while we give the presentation. Um, but you know, they don't have a stinger. Males in particular have nothing like that that could hurt you. Females do have an ovipositor and it is a hard structure. Um, some people say that they have experienced cicadas trying to, again, probe them with the ovipositor, but I've never heard of anybody really being stung or injured by this. And they'd have to be sitting there for a very long time. And I don't think that you would really be the type of host that they're looking for to possibly put their, um, their eggs in. Now, one of the other things, like I was saying beforehand, is some people don't like the way they feel when they're walking on them. And I should preface this with saying, I'm very comfortable with insects and I have no problem with them crawling on me. I don't get alarmed when they attach themselves to me or to my clothes. Um, but a lot of people don't have that kind of comfort with them. Um, if you've ever had like a Japanese beetle land on you or something like that, you can tell that like when you go to brush them away, they kind of stick a little bit. Um, they have little claws on the ends of their feet, so they're little tarsi. And these can get hooked into fabric, they can get hooked onto your skin. And when you rip an insect away, you actually can potentially damage or even break off parts of their feet. So I always try and suggest that if you can, and if you're not panicking, you know, breathe for a second and then try to gently unhook them. If you begin to move them a little bit, the insect will start to try and pick up its feet as well um, and unhook those claws. And then you can very easily try and move them onto a different surface. Um, I know a lot of times I kind of help people with this just to, so that they don't have to necessarily address it themselves. So if you're somebody who's comfortable with it and you see somebody else who isn't comfortable with it, um, it's a really good idea just to see if you can assist them. Um, again, be careful. You know, we don't want people to get harmed. We don't want to, you know, we want to respect people's boundaries and distances. Always ask before those types of things. But, you know, again, our comfort levels with them is varies and I never try and pressure insects onto people who aren't ready for them who you know are you know the fear of insects is a very realistic thing but I always want to encourage people or show people that you know they don't have to be afraid and they can enjoy them from a distance whether they're on me or I'm handling them but you know I just definitely want to let people know that this that cicadas are not something they should fear that said again I know that they can be a 
abominable flyers and they tend to bounce off of everything. They tend to land on you when you're not expecting it. I've seen articles where people have gotten into accidents because a cicada flew at them and it panicked them. So I understand that it's not always that simple, but definitely with these guys, you know, having a modicum of patience, just understanding that they don't have a lot of great control over their ability, over their flight abilities. So even if they want to go in this direction and you're over here, you might accidentally be on that path that they're going on. All right. So let's talk a little bit about the difference between annual and periodical cicadas. I just got to watch my time. All right. So to me, they're very distinctive and different. Um, if you look to the left, you're going to see our uh, periodical cicadas. These are the guys that are out right now. They are very distinctive in the fact that they tend to be a little bit smaller. Their heads are narrow. Their bodies are a little bit more narrow. They have either orange or red eyes, though we do have some very cool bluish or white morphs in the eyes. And if you ever find one, that's a really great thing. You should take a picture and send it to an entomologist you know. You can send it to me if you do. Um, they tend to have more of a black and orange coloration. So that is our periodical cicada. And then if you look here to the right, we have what we call our annual or dog day cicadas. Um, saying that they're an annual cicada is a little bit confusing. So annual cicadas actually do live longer than one year. Most of them live somewhere between two and five years. But um, because they're not synced the same way that the species in the periodical cicadas are, they, we tend to see a little bit of them every single year. And another big distinction between the two groups is, you know, we're seeing the periodical cicadas right now. So they come out starting in this area in particular, they start coming out in like mid-May, and then they last for four to six weeks, and then they'll kind of fade off here at the end of June. And a lot of people are already starting to notice them fading off already, or that they've moved into the trees to start their choruses. Whereas our other cicadas, so our annual cicadas, they tend to come out a little bit later in the summer. So a lot of times we start to see them more towards like the end of July, even beginning of August, depending on where you're located. So that's another kind of way to tell them apart. These two species or these two groups of cicadas don't actually overlap with each other. And it's interesting because um, we'll talk a little bit about the defense mechanisms of periodical cicadas, but annual cicadas, because there's a few coming out every single year, they actually do have specialist predators who look for them when they're out and they're synced up with their cycle. So many of you might be familiar with cicada killers, which are those giant sphesid wasps that are out. They're really kind of fascinating. I love them. And again, they can potentially harm you, but most of the time they're not going to harm you. They're just big, bulky, scary looking wasps that are really uh, driven to try and find cicadas because they need them to feed their offspring. So I spend a lot of time walking around them and I've never been stung by one. I can imagine it would be very painful, but again, as long as you're not holding them or trying to trap them, they're really not going to try and hurt you. So again, these are kind of our different types of cicadas, but I definitely want to talk more about our periodical cicadas since this is really such a unique event. So what I was telling you guys beforehand is I think a lot of people when they're like, oh, this is brood X, most people assume that it's just one species, but it's actually made up of three different types of species. Now, you are predominantly going to see the one main one, which is that first cicada there. I am not going to butcher that name, but the first cicada here on the left hand side, which looks to be the largest one, that's the bulk that you're going to see when you're out there. I've been lucky because I've been trying to go out and see if I can identify some of the other species over the past couple of weeks. I have been able to come up with the middle species, which we often refer to as the dwarf species. Um, I have not found any of that final species, um, and it is, it's a very rare species. And I tend to find that when I'm looking for cicadas and I want to find the dwarfs, I tend to find them in smaller pockets somewhere. So I have a park that's very close to where I live, and when I go out, I'll see a bunch of the regular ones, but then I'll find a very specific pocket where I've seen an emergence of the dwarfs coming out. And some really neat, th uh, easy way to tell the dwarf from our more traditional one, which I think the common name is a pharaoh cicada, um, is this idea that, you know, you usually have these orange bands that are found on the bottom of the abdomen here, whereas with the dwarf, it's completely dark, so completely black on the underside, and that's a very easy way to tell. And the other size is, uh, the other one is size difference, but again, sometimes that can be a little hard because you can just have small um, cicadas of like the more common species, so it's really a nice way to distinguish them is by looking at these bands that are on the abdomen here. Um, one of the other things I would like to point out is that out of all the different broods that are across the United States, 
um, they're made up of seven species. And so of these seven species, here are three, and these three are the 17 year cicadas. And then all the other ones are actually 13 year cicadas. And I can show you right here with a map. So this is a map I think generated by the um, Forest Service, and it actually shows you the range of all of the different broods, cicada broods across the United States, and it has them numbered out. And then it'll even kind of show you when we can expect the next emergence. But if you look at this, most of these are 17 year cicadas, which means that each one of these different broods is actually those three species, but they're timed out differently. These, they've synced differently in different areas for when they come out. And then it's only about three broods that actually make up the larger number of species, which is the 13 year cicadas, which is very interesting to me how more of them have, you know, evolved to be these 17 year cicadas versus these 13 year cicadas. And so this is just kind of looking at brood X in particular. And what you can notice here is like, even within the range of brood X, there's going to be more kind of hot spots where you're going to see them. And I've been checking in with uh, different entomologists and people I know from different areas. I have a lot of family over in Delaware in particular. And it's been interesting to me because even though Delaware is supposed to be a big hot spot for them, um, a lot of people, especially in Southern Delaware, haven't been reporting quite the same numbers that we're seeing, say, over here in Maryland, Virginia, and parts of DC. So it kind of fluctuates. And some of that does have to do with um, what's happened to the landscape during the time period in which they've been underground. Because remember, a landscape can change dramatically over 17 years. And when you build over structures, um, those Cicadas are probably going to try and come up, but they're going to have nowhere to go. So obviously, we always lose a portion of the population. That's that's nature. Um, not all cicadas make it to the surface. Not all cicadas emerge appropriately, and many of them often die within you know the first hours of being alive. That's part of their defense mechanism that we're talking about, which is this the idea of just overwhelming the system so that enough of them survive. So it's really kind of interesting to look at these maps and see where we've predicted to have these like larger populations. And again, it has to do with like the makeup of the forest and environment, but also how much that's changed and human activity involved with it. So this is back to what I was saying beforehand. Why 17 years? And so there's a lot of theories out here. I'm sure many of you have actually heard some of them before, which is this idea that, um, you know, they've evolved to do this because it's a defense mechanism against predators. And, you know, I've heard both sides of it. And it, it's interesting because there are some people who say, yeah, that makes a lot of sense, but why 17 years? And obviously there's a 13 year as well, but why aren't there more intervals in between? Like, why do we not see a seven year, a nine year, you know, that sort of situation if they're just trying to escape predators? Um, so that's kind of an interesting question. I don't know that we have a full answer for just yet, but it is, I do think it's a part of it is that by waiting longer periods of time, um, insects can start to escape predator pressure, especially predators who start to look for them or start to specialize on them, kind of like our annual cicadas who have a very specific wasp that just specializes on those annual cicadas. Now, the other, um, the other defense practice that they're putting into place is this, um, you know, this overwhelming system where it's just like they reproduce in mass and if there's enough of them flooding the system, so three different species have synced up in the hopes that they're going to be the ones that survive. Because maybe if it was just one species and they have a terrible year or they just, it, it happens to be a year that a lot of predators get them, then it's more likely to wipe them out. So you have three different species that are all coming out at the same time. And in, I think by over flooding that system, they're able to defeat the amount of predators and other features that are going to potentially wipe them out. So again, the 17 year aspect of them um, has a lot to do with trying to just survive. And it's a very long game if you think about it in terms of like survival, it's spending 17 years in the ground. But that being said, the ground isn't completely safe for them. There are predators in that environment, but it is much safer for them, say, when they get above ground where they have to deal with a lot more mammals and birds and even funguses that are attacking them. So it's really kind of interesting to see this evolution of 17 years. So this is a timeline that um, we had somebody here at the Smithsonian help put together for me. And I did notice that there was one um, little error on here, which is if you go to the coursing and flicking part there, it's actually supposed to say from June, um, from May through June. But so if you look at this, 
Um, we're now past the point in which they have started to emerge. Though I still do feel like I see pockets where I see newly emerging individuals, but I no longer see the ones where they've come up through the ground and they're starting to break out of that nymphal skin. So we are definitely into the adults and we're actually fully into now the singing and that chorusing time period. And we'll talk a little bit about males singing and the females responding to them. So we actually probably only have maybe about three more weeks left of the periodical cicadas. And again, I like to point out the fact that it's like, while this might seem like a hindrance to some people who don't love this particular stage, um, in three weeks, they're going to be gone and then we won't see them again for another 17 years. So just hang on. But if you love them, this is such a great time period to be out and witnessing them. I particularly love the early part of the season, uh, early part of their emergence when they're literally coming out of ground because you just get these wonderful up close looks at them and can really see all of their details and really just spend time kind of like noticing all of their different features and what they're doing. And um, I love, especially when they're first coming out, when they start to pump out their wings. And so just as a point of reference here, so once we get past the coursing and the singing, that's usually a place when most people think, okay, the cicadas are done. But really what's happening is that, you know, the eggs are getting ready to hatch, which we'll see that later on in June, uh, July and August, which is funny because that's about the same time that our annual cicadas are coming out. Um, but the other thing that most people notice after the cicadas is, if there is tree damage to be seen, that's when you start to see the tree damage. So they kind of have a little bit of a lasting effect afterwards. So this was what I was talking about beforehand earlier in the season. So this was like, you know, the last couple of weeks of May, which is when they're first coming out. Uh, here is one of your quiz words, the nymphal skin in which they um, emerge out of is called the exuviae. And um, so what you have here is an adult who is emerging from a split seam in the back of the exuvia, which is really kind of neat. So all cicadas, if you ever notice, if you ever take a good look at those skins that have now been cast off, those nymphal skins, you will see that there's actually a ridge there. And that's designed that way so that when they start to expand and they're trying to push oxygen and like fluids into the other parts of their body to break free, it always breaks along that seam. And then they're going to start trying to push out so that they can do this. So here um, you have an, you know, this is again an adult who's pushing out, and what they're doing is they're expanding their body. You know, they're trying to pump out their wings. They're trying to get their wings to unfurl. And one of the biggest things is a lot of people are like, I didn't know they were white. Well, they're only white because the um, the tannins, the the um, materials inside their body that make up their cuticle, which will make up their exoskeleton, is still soft. And they need that as part of the breaking out process because they don't want to be hard when they break out. They need time to expand into this new skin um, that they're going to have. And before that starts to harden and settle, they need to have this very vulnerable stage in which they're very soft. But they can use that time period to, again, expand their wings, expand their body so that they'll finally have their final adult stage. And I love this image because, again, you can really see that even when they've emerged from this nymphal skin, they have fully developed antennae. They have that fully developed mouth part. You can actually see like the tube that runs down the middle of that mouth part. You can see some of the veins inside the wing. And all of these little features are just very much highlighted when they first come out before they fully harden. And then you have these beautiful, amazing adults. And I know somebody else was asking me this in an earlier meeting, um, you know, about seeing them back to back like this. And yes, this is how cicadas actually um, mate with each other. And so when you see this with the overlapping wings, you know, they're joined and this is the mating pose that they have. I always love this because um, a lot of times when they're out in the street sometimes and they're in mating pose, I am that person who walks around and tries to move them so that they don't get crushed. The females are very like, go with it. They, they're like, yeah, fine, I'll move with you. The males are the exact opposite. The males start to yell at you. They'll flap at you. They'll do anything and everything because they just feel like you're messing up what they're trying to do. So they have a very strong drive, but usually you can move the pair very safely and they won't become uncoupled. Mm -hmm. So I did want to talk a little bit about the sound. Um, I'm sure you're hearing them. If you're, like I said, if you're in an area where there are currently periodical cicadas out, it's very hard to miss them. Uh, if I was to open up my door right now, you'd hear this beautiful, ethereal, otherworldly chorus that's going on because I am up close to a tree canopy and they are singing all day. Oops, sorry, buddy. They're singing all day, um, every opportunity that they can. And just wanted to talk a little bit about how this is occurring and who's doing it. 
So um, that coursing sound that you're hearing, that's done by the males. The males are calling out and what they actually have is a special organ that is located here on the underside of their wing. You can see from the pictures with the arrows here and it's really kind of neat, it's a membrane and what they're actually doing is kind of vibrating or pulling on these little minute muscles to vibrate this membrane. And that's what generates that sound. And it's so impressive because they're so small and this organ is so small, but together they start to make all of this noise where they can be heard for miles. And one of the um, interesting things about it is the amount and the levels <clears throat> of sound that they can create. Uh, one of the big ones about it is this idea that like when I have to give talks to our staff, I often have to discuss the fact that if they're in an area where populations are incredibly high for extended periods of time and they're working outside, they actually need to wear hearing protection because cicadas, particularly periodical cicadas that are coming out in these mass broods can reach levels of like 80 to 100 decibels. So for most people in a, a health work situation, once you get over 85 decibels, that's when you can actually start to get hearing damage if you sit in it for extended periods of time. So we're always like, okay, if you think that you're gonna be outside working in an area and it's getting really loud, you actually might wanna consider hearing protection from cicadas. Um, and just to kind of give you kind of an idea of like what that sounds like, like 80 decibels is kind of close to like, okay, you hear a lot of heavy traffic, whereas Closer to 100 decibels, you're looking at like a boombox or a motorcycle going off right beside you. So they can really reach these peak levels. And I actually had a coworker who took a little um, uh, measuring instrument outside. And I think when they had it up, it was near like 90 decibels. So if you go to some areas, you can really hear them at that peak. And it's so fascinating just to think that these tiny insects are the ones who are generating all that noise. So that is part of it. So before we got started with our, um, before they started emerging this year, I was giving a lot of talks to various types of staff and people were sitting there trying to say, okay, so how many can we really expect? And you know, what are we gonna see here? And um, there's a very well-known entomologist uh, right down the road for me, um, Dr. Mike Raup. And he actually said that, you know, in some areas we can see up to 1.5 million cicadas per acre. And whenever I tell people that, they're just absolutely blown away with the idea that you could see that many cicadas in a, such a small, I don't want to say such a small space, but that is a very dense space when you think about the, like the full map that they um, exist over. And it's funny because before this started happening, I think a lot of people couldn't imagine that. And now if you walk outside, you can definitely picture that because the sounds that you're hearing or when you start seeing them emerging, or if you check at the bottom of trees, you're starting to see all of those shed skins. And it really starts to put into perspective the high number of cicadas that can exist in an area. And I think the neat part about all this is the fact that these guys have been living under our feet for 17 years, and we just never really thought about them until now, until they've become very visible and very um, audible to us. So I just think that that's really kind of a fascinating thing is the sheer number of cicadas that we're seeing. And again, this is that overwhelming defense. Like if there's enough of them, I don't think that there's enough animals around to eat that many cicadas. So talking back a little bit about the potential for harm for plants. This is a question that comes up a lot, especially because I work specifically in garden areas is, you know, before we even got into the cicada season, people were saying, okay, well, what should I be doing for my plants? Um, and this is actually the time when you really want to be paying attention to plants that might be vulnerable. So the big thing is that, again, they're not harming the plants, they're not harming the trees or the shrubs and vines. I should point out that woody vines are also susceptible to damage from cicadas. And I know I particularly had somebody who worked in a vineyard who was very concerned about damage from cicadas, but it's not from the feeding. It's not from the nymphs, it's not from the adults feeding. The damage literally comes about because when the females go to lay their eggs, what they do is their ovipositor is actually almost like a sword or a, a cut, it creates a cut and they cut lengthwise into these branches and lay their eggs into it. And if you have a small enough branch, which for most trees, um, cicadas tend to prefer um, twigs or branches that are about um, a quarter to half an inch in diameter. So especially when you have small trees, so not so much with your large healthy adult trees, they actually do pretty well with this. But when you have small trees, so like a tree that you've planted in the last year or two, or say you have something like a ginkgo tree that has a very strong leader and it's a young tree, 
that can do a lot of damage because what they can do is they can accidentally kill that leader or on a small tree that has a lot of small twigs and branches, they can do a lot more damage. Whereas where a larger tree will have many more branches and twigs that have different diameters that the cicadas aren't really gonna hurt. So that's where you do have to be a little bit careful with um, you know, the possibility of a cicada doing damage. And it's this time, like once the mating has occurred and once the females are laying eggs, this is when you really want to be trying to protect your trees that are vulnerable to it. But obviously for most trees, you don't need to worry about this. Actually, what I want to point out is the fact that cicada is actually very good for plants and can be very good for trees. One of the biggest things is when they first started coming out, you might have noticed that there were a lot of these little holes coming up through the ground. So these are their little tunnels, their little chimneys that they use to exit the ground and start crawling out the surface. These holes can be really critical for trees that um, don't get a lot of aeration, um, especially downtown in DC for us. A lot of our trees have um, compacted soil due to the fact of people walking over top of it. And so we try very hard to do different techniques to try and get aeration back down into those roots so that the trees continue to grow. Because again, compacted soils can impact root growth. Um, so by doing this, these guys are actually aerating the soil. They're allowing water and moisture and oxygen to get back down into those root systems. So all these um, millions of cicadas coming out are allowing us to aerate the soil. And then the um, other side of that is that once the cicadas die, their bodies begin to break down. They actually kind of act as a fertilizer to a lot of these trees as well. So they're fertilizing the trees on their way out. And then a lot of people, you know, don't necessarily see this as a positive, but if you talk to arborists and other types of people who work with trees, it can be a good thing, which is, remember how I was saying that they tend to um, specialize on, you know, quarter to half inch twigs. Well, for a lot of trees, those are sometimes their weakest um, branches. And so what the cicadas are actually doing is by killing those branches, if they're not strong enough to be able to recover from the egg masses being laid in it, then essentially it prunes that branch out of the tree. And so instead of putting energy into a branch that might not have been as strong, uh, would be a weak branch, the tree is now going to put energy into growth around it and into other branches. And a lot of people will actually see that after the flagging stage, which is where the branches that have been killed by the egg laying, um, the tree puts out a lot of new growth. So there's a lot of potential for trees to actually kind of boom back after, you know, a cicada event like this. So actually cicadas can be very good for trees, even though you would think it would be less so given, you know, that they're feeding on them and then they're cutting them and they're laying their eggs in them. So just talking a little bit about control, if you do have um, areas that you want to control, the best way to protect your trees, your vines, your vineyards, um, those types of things is netting. And I know it seems extensive. Remember, if you're getting really big trees, you don't need to be doing this. It's really not going to, they're, what they're doing is probably not going to hurt them. Whereas when you have these smaller trees, you definitely want to. The big thing I do want to point out is do not use pesticides. You have probably heard this multiple times, but I'm going to explain to you why. Like many types of insects, they will probably move off before they're ever impacted by that chemical. But even if they were impacted by it, they tend to still move off or they drop down to the ground. Well, right now, there are lots of things that are eating them. And what you're more likely to do is poison something else by accident, by trying to get rid of these cicadas. You are more likely to poison a bird or even potentially a pet. So this is really kind of the reason, you know, if possible, try not to use pesticides because you're gonna have more non-target impacts than you are if you just use physical barriers. And just as a point of interest with the physical barrier side of this, you wanna make sure that you've got very like small holes in your netting. So I think they said about half inch is really preferred. And really all you're trying to do is just keep it so that the females can not get down to those branches and start laying eggs. That's all you need to do is just keep them a little bit off of the plant. You don't have to make sure that they can't touch it at all. You just don't want them getting onto the laying those um, on those long twigs. So again, talking about are they harmful to animals? Absolutely not. A lot of animals right now have moved over to trying to feed on them. Actually, that was a really cool and interesting article I read. I heard that copper copperheads, copperheads are cottonmouths. One of the two different types of snakes actually starts to eat cicadas when they come out like this, but you're going to notice all kinds. I mean, I see birds out there. I see other insects out there trying to feed on them. Squirrels are feeding on them. And if you have pets that go outside, I'm sure you've noticed that your pets try to eat them. So please understand that they're not harmful. They can eat as many as they want. Actually, there's some jokes about the fact that like animals will go into food comas from being such gluttons on cicadas, but the cicadas are actually very good for them. Cicadas are simple proteins 
And so for them, it kind of is like having a protein shake, which is really kind of the neat part of this. Um, is that a lot of animals will actually do much better. You will see um, a lot more birds laying eggs. You will see a lot more, you know, potential small mammals having babies. So really, again, much like the trees kind of have a boom period post cicadas, you're probably going to notice that the animals also have a bit of a boom period following cicadas. And with that, I'd also like to point out the fact that we can eat cicadas. Um, I always, people always want to know what they can do with cicadas and what's my ideas of activities and stuff. And I have not had any myself, um, but quite a few of my coworkers have eaten cicadas and have tried them now and have been reporting back into me. I am definitely not afraid to eat insects. I think they're very good for us. Um, so try out some different recipes if you're adventurous enough to do it. I will point out one note, there has been some articles and some research out there that if you are allergic to shellfish, you may have a reaction to cicadas. So definitely if you have those types of dietary restrictions, make sure that you're being careful if this is something you wanna try. Um, the other thing I would say is use this as an amazing learning opportunity. Obviously I'm doing these types of presentations, but I love going out into nature. Everybody I talk to stops to see what I'm doing with cicadas and I just love using this as a learning ability to other people. Um, explore um, kids in particular, but not just kids, adults too. You know, if you're comfortable enough handling them, pick them up, look at them, see them, you know, like feel them, you know, understand what they are, listen to them. You know, it's really, you know, we don't usually get to have these types of interactions in quite this way. So, you know, enjoy it while it's here. Um, the other thing is a lot of people like to do art projects. I like to use this time to teach people how to pin insects for histor or for entomological collections, obviously once they're dead. Um, but a lot of people have really amazing artwork out there. There's a guy who actually uses the caskins to make almost like monster action figures out of them. And I feel like you have to have a lot of patience to be able to do that kind of stuff. But that's the thing is, there's so much that you can do. Use your creativity, make art, make jewelry, but just get out there and experience them while they're here. And so with that, that's really kind of my final message to you is um, this idea that it's gonna be 17 years before you see them again. So why not? I mean, take this opportunity if you are interested, you know, it's definitely an event that's worth seeing. It's a natural phenomena and you know, we should appreciate the fact that we get to experience these really cool cycles. And I think with that, I need to be done. I wanted to say thank you to everybody for joining me. I will try and take as many questions as I can in the amount of time that I have. Um, but yes, thank you guys again for joining me today. Holly, that was great. I now feel like I am so educated about cicadas. I really appreciate it and learned a bunch of different new uh, facts and figures. But we do have a couple questions okay. that uh, you can enlighten us even more. So uh, a gentleman wrote and said, he, are there concerns that brood X is in uh, decline? Uh, are they, have they been removed or, or excluded from Long Island. Uh, they're not seeing as many up there. And are groups evaluating the brood's overall health and viability? I don't have the exact figures on all that stuff, but I can tell you that there's a lot of people out there who are absolutely looking at the numbers, who are doing research on them. Um, like I said, we have a few universities around here, um, particularly closest to us is University of Maryland, but I can tell you that there's a lot of universities, um, particularly with entomological programs who are studying these types of things. I don't know what the research has said in terms of the decline, but I can tell you, as I pointed out before, um, what can happen to them has to do with how much we change the environment around us. Absolutely, humans have an impact on their populations. And the more that we develop certain types of areas or we change certain types of areas that they live, we will start to see declines. And also, I'm sure you guys noticed when they first came out, a lot were killed by cars, a lot are smashed, a lot are ground up, those types of things. So obviously we have impacts on them. And I imagine that we probably do have a certain amount, but there are other factors that play in as well. Temperature and um, weather conditions can have an impact on when they're first coming out, timing um, and how successful they are. If the weather conditions aren't right when they come out, they can have deformed wings, they can have deformed bodies, or they might not um, fully emerge as adult, that can impact them. So there's natural variables variables and there's definitely human variables, um, but I can definitely see where we as humans have an impact on them. 
And I'm sure there'll be lots of reports after this big emergence that will uh, show those numbers, that will share them with people so that we know exactly when, what went on this year. So I look forward to reading a lot of those reports and those articles, and I'm sure you'll keep us updated as well. Agreed. Uh, which is terrific. Um, also, it, this is something I've been thinking about. You, you mentioned if it's if uh, a sidewalk or a road is put over in an area, the cicadas probably won't make it out of there. What happens if the tree that they've been feeding on dies, for either chopped down or just dies of natural causes? Do they move to someplace else, or is that the end for that brood? It depends. So it, it's it is a, again a combination. I hate to say it, these are never simple answers in the sense that um, if there's other food sources close by and they're able to make that move because obviously they can move from grasses to trees. If they're able to make that move, they're probably most likely to do that. But that has to be a resource that's close enough by. Um, the other side of it, it has to do with how far along they are in their development. Mm -hmm. I was talking to somebody else about the fact that if an insect is far enough along in its development, even if it's a little on the smaller side it will sometimes shorten its life cycle down and try to kind of come out a little bit earlier or it will kind of go into a pausing stage. Um, and then just when it hits its cycle, it'll emerge that way. But there is also the possibility that they don't find food if they're, they're not at the right stage or that they become vulnerable or that during that move they get eaten. Mm. Um, so there's a lot of factors that they could still absolutely get, they could absolutely die or not make it um, due to the like removal of a tree or removal of those types of things in their environment. So absolutely, if the food source is gone, they're they're going to struggle and they're going to have to either find a relatively quick food source or potentially perish. Yeah, it would tie it into that question about how far underneath the ground are they when they're in their uh, uh, the early stage? So in the early stage, they're actually very close because, again, you've got to think about grass roots. However, once they start getting bigger and they start moving to tree roots, they actually want to get a little bit further down. And so a lot of the data says that they're usually about two feet under the ground. And again, this protects them from, oh, it gets even more. So um, they can be found as low as eight feet underground, depending on what the tree's root systems are. Um, but that's a bit extreme for them. But they do want to be far enough down because as they were starting to come up, you noticed that um, animals were starting to feed on them because the animals can hear them and they mm -hmm. can sense them and they're going to start looking for them. So they have to stay far enough down that they're mostly protected from those surface scavenging and digging types of animals. Mm. I, I never even thought about that, but yeah, because I see badgers and skunks and everything digging in the ground. So yeah, mm -hmm. they've got to go below that. What sound does the female cicada make? Oh, so since female cicadas don't have that um, timbal organ on the side, females actually make a clicking and a wing click and clacking kind of noise, and that's her responding. So that's the other sound that you sometimes hear, but it's definitely not as loud as the males that you're hearing. But you will sometimes hear a female, if she's close to a male, she'll start clacking her wings and she'll make a click noise over and over again, and that's her responding. Okay. Yeah, when I've picked them up, sometimes it must be the females are picking up because they make that clicking noise uh, mm -hmm. to go along. People are oh. commenting on your your shirt too, so <laughs> your oh, yeah. friends. Yeah. Yes, um, one quick thing about males and females. Let me go back to the picture just real quick of the three. So if you look at this picture, the one on the left, which is the most common one, that is a female. I know it's hard to see in this picture, but you'll see that there's kind of a cleft area and then she has like a kind of like a spike that runs between. That's her ovipositor. Whereas the other two, if you look at the abdomens there, at the tail end or the bottom there, they're just kind of blunt. Those are males. So it's very easy when you turn them over to tell if it's a female or a male because the female will have that kind of like spear-like ovipositor coming out of the bottom. Oh, great. Okay, now I'll be able to tell who's who uh, yeah. when I go out there and see it. Uh, let's see, how deep, there's an area, it's, they're talking about Montgomery County and had relatively early first emergence, uh, May 3rd, and then they noticed that there's much quieter today than last week. Is their singing period ending here or did the partial eclipse subdue them or maybe the weather? Why would they stop singing? Well, if they had an early emergence, they're probably starting to reach the end of that time period. And again, they do just kind of come out in pockets all over the place. We tend to get a lot of them at one time, but since it sounded like they had a really early one, they might now be, you know, here we are almost four weeks, almost five weeks actually after that, they're definitely, that, that population's probably winding down. But uh, weather definitely does impact them. I know that as soon as we start to get the storms, and we've had a lot of storms lately, mm -hmm. they get quiet before the storm, and then they pipe up afterwards. But mm -hmm. I wouldn't be surprised if, since they had such an early emergence, that they're probably seeing less of them now since they're getting past that stage. The females have probably laid their eggs. And now, as soon as they're done laying their eggs, that's it. They're done. You know, they've done their 
duty and that's it. Yeah. 17 years for that. <laughs> Sometimes I think my life is boring. <laughs> um, how, what about the eggs? How long do they remain in the tree and then hatch? How long does that period take between uh, being deposited and then hatching? It's only a couple of weeks. Like I said, we'll see the last of the eggs being laid in the next couple of weeks. And then those ones will probably emerge in August. So you're probably looking at maybe like six weeks, two months, maybe something along okay. that. Okay. Yeah. And like you told me ahead of time, they're about the size of a rice kernel. And yes, then, like a little yeah. grain of rice. Yep. And they'll okay. just drop down. And like I said, they'll move to grassroots or yeah, to the roots of grass. So as soon as they drop down, you'll literally, if you don't watch, you'll miss them. They drop down and then they're in the soil. So you have a very narrow window of catching them when they're coming down. Mm -hmm. uh, they're always fun at that stage. I love it. Uh, let's see. Uh, one of the trees in their neighborhood is incredibly loud. Do they prefer some trees over others? Yes. Oh, so that was something I meant to mention beforehand. They have definitely have host plant range, even though they are very opportunistic. Um, they um, will feed on about 250 described different species of trees. They do not like um, conifer trees, so they don't like evergreens and things like that. They love deciduous. They tend to like maples, ash, willows, those types of things. So they really kind of focus on it. I definitely see them on a lot of the shrubs around here. But again, you want that like woody, that soft or not even soft, it's like hardwood as well. But you know, that woody material, but definitely not in the evergreen so much. They definitely tend to seem to do deciduous trees and small shrubs. That might be the resin in the evergreens too, that they wouldn't like because it would give you that piney taste and yeah. go along. Maybe they like cherry flavor better instead. Um, what about the fungus that uh, we've read about and listened uh, to on uh, t television reports? What is the fungus and what does it do to them? No, I don't have as much information about the fungus, but from what I understand, um, you know, it attaches to them, it tends to attach to their abdomen. So if you've ever seen one that's attached, it just, you know, it completely covers their abdomen, but it actually kind of gives them a drive because obviously they already have the drive to mate, but by mating is how they actually kind of spread it around. And obviously it does kill them. Um, but, you know, that's a lot of en entomopathic funguses out there um, get kind of hooked up with a host and they utilize their own natural drives to try and like control, not that they're trying to control their population, they're just trying to have a food source to generate more spores to continue to do it, but they do tend to control a certain part of the population. Interesting thing to me is I know somebody who's looking for specimens that have it and I've had a lot of difficulty finding it mm -hmm. um, and I'm going out almost every day and I've only found like maybe a handful of specimens that actually have it. So. I would think even with all of our humidity, we'd be doing great, but maybe we just don't have, at least where I'm at, the right conditions to really kind of spread it. I apologize, I don't have more about that full life cycle of that um, fungus. I'm sure we can Google it and find it too. So that'd be good, including how about a, a spot that we can hear the cicadas sing if we want to do want to hear a recording instead of go outside or send somebody. Do you know University of Maryland or Cornell yeah. University? So um, again, uh, again, because of our proximity to University of Maryland, they actually have a team of students and researchers and you know uh, their staff that have a really cool website called Cicada Mania. You should go to <laughs> Cicada Mania. They have lots of really cool files, lots of little information snippets. Um, they will also answer questions, but they are literally doing everything. They've got students out eating them, collecting them, those sorts of things. So check out some of the different things, but there's a lot of great resources. I was tempted to try and put one of my own videos because I've gone out and recorded them quite a bit, but I never quite trust them in my presentations, but there are <laughs> definitely fantastic ways to go out, or not go out, but um, listen to them on your computer um, because they're just, it's, it's very ethereal. Mm -hmm. It is very ethereal, uh, almost like whale singing, but the insect version of it, yeah. uh, which I think is very cool. Um, has, are there any studies, maybe that uh, uh, cicada mania, uh, talking about climate change and the effect of climate change on the cicadas? I'm sure that there are. I haven't noticed too many recently. And again, you know, the last time these guys was out in, um, was out in uh, 2004. So I imagine that that is going to become a much more popular topic this time around with everybody mm -hmm. looking at, um, you know, what is going on. And we're having more of those discussions now as well. Mm -hmm. So I would definitely keep an eye out after this, after this population is done, when people start pulling that research and kind of trying to draw those conclusions. I, I agree. I would definitely look towards University of Maryland or Cornell or Virginia Tech or someplace that is going to be in the midst of them. Actually, more Maryland than Virginia Tech. They don't seem to be down in that part of Virginia as much 
Uh, just yeah, south. that's yeah. just south of us. They're absolutely not there, which is just so amazing to see that cutoff line just a few miles from where I am. Yes, I agree. Well, Holly, thank you so much. I'm always fascinated with stories of insects because as a horticulturist, they're part of our world, but I, I've never studied them uh, as much as I should. Maybe I'll start reading even more, but thank you for that. And I want to let people know we do have more information on our website on gardens.si.edu about uh, the cicadas and a very beautiful poster that Tali worked with a graphic designer to, to draw, to make for us. So you can print it off and you can remember the year of the cicadas and uh, decorate your room with cicadas as Holly has decorated hers with the beautiful uh, wallpaper and just enjoy them. They are a little bit creepy uh, and they surprise you when they jump on you, but Holly, you've let me know that I don't have anything to fear from them. I just like you and enjoying them and I hope all of you have really learned more about them so that you can enjoy them as well. So thank you once again. Thanks to everybody for joining us and Holly, thank you for educating us. Thank we'll you see guys. you next time. Okay. Bye-bye. Come to the gardens. Bye-bye. <laughs>